Welcome to Electron Online, and now we truly are going to take the divergence of the cylindrical vector field, and here it is in front of you, but let me talk you through it. I didn't want you to watch me write this down very carefully because it takes a long time, but here it is, and let me explain how that works. So here we have the del operator, and we're going to multiply that times the vector. There's the rho, the phi, and the z coordinates of the vector or vector field. And when we take the divergence of that, notice that for each term here applied to each of those terms there, we're going to end up with two separate terms. So 3 times 3 times 2, that's a total of 18 terms here. Notice we took the rho unit vector, took it outside, and now we're going to take the partial derivative with respect to rho of those three terms. You end up with these first two terms, and the way that works is notice that each of these are products. So we take the first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. And we do that for all three terms. We do it again for the second set. Notice for the second set, we have the phi unit vector and one over rho taken out. And then we take the partial derivative with respect to phi of those three terms. Again, those are products. So we have to take the first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. Again, the first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. And we use the product rule all the way through. Now, when we want to finish this, notice that some of these will automatically go to zero. Anytime when we have a dot product of a unit vector with another unit vector, if they're orthogonal or perpendicular to each other, they will simply negate, right? So because whenever you have a dot product of two vectors that are perpendicular to each other, it's the magnitude of the two vectors, one times one, because they're unit vectors, times the cosine of the angle between them, the cosine of 90 degrees, of course, is zero, and then that simply disappears. So rho dot phi, that simply becomes zero, and rho dot z, that also simply becomes zero. Now what about the partial of the z unit vector with respect to rho? When rho changes right here, when rho becomes longer, that has no effect on the, 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 the length or the direction of the z unit vector. So the derivative of this with respect to rho, that doesn't change, so that goes to zero. And over here, the derivative of rho of, of the phi unit vector with respect to rho, as rho gets longer, it has no effect on the direction or the length of phi. So you can see here that this will also go to zero. That means you just have these two terms left over. Now, the derivative of rho with respect to rho, again, if rho becomes longer, the unit vector is now going to change, so this is also zero. That means you only have one term left here. That means that this becomes rho unit vector multiplied times the rho unit vector, which is one, and the only surviving portion of that will be the partial of a with respect to rho with respect, I should say, the partial of the rho component of A with respect to rho is the only remaining part of this whole derivative. Now to the second part right here, we can do the same thing. When we multiply this times this, notice that that will be orthogonal to each other, so this disappears, and this multiplied times this, that's also orthogonal to each other, that disappears. The partial of z with respect to rho, remember that z doesn't change when rho changes, so that goes to zero. And let's see here, what else do we have? This survives. How about this? The partial of rho with respect to rho. Notice that this a negative phi unit vector, so that survives. And what about here? How does the rho unit vector changes when phi changes? As phi changes, the rho unit vector does change. So we do have to take that into account. So there's some surviving terms here. We have to take all the surviving terms. So this multiplied times this. Notice that the partial of phi with respect to rho is going to be the phi unit vector. And so then we have phi unit vector times phi unit vector, which is equal to one. So we end up with plus a sub rho divided by rho. So this term survives. How about this one right here? the phi unit vector with respect to phi. Notice that it's minus rho, but minus rho times the phi unit vector, when I multiply those together, I get zero, so this term disappears. And then this term multiplied times this term, this times this is one, so we end up with plus one over rho times the partial of a with respect to rho. And of course, that's the phi component of a. 
And finally, coming down to the third part right here, notice when I multiply these two together, I get zero. When I multiply z times rho, that gets zero. When I take the parcel of rho with respect to z, that gives me zero. The parcel of phi with respect to z, that gives me zero. And the parcel of z with respect to z, that gives me zero as well. The only surviving term is this multiplied times this, z times z is one, and we get plus the parcel of a sub z with respect to z. Now notice I did something else over here on the right side of the board. I wrote that 1 over rho times a partial with respect to rho of rho times a sub phi can be written as that. When you come over here, notice we have the a sub rho over rho, we have this term, and we have the first one, the partial of a sub rho with respect to phi. That means that those two combined can be written as 1 over rho times the partial with respect to rho of phi times a sub phi. That's the typical way in which they write this. So we're going to take those two terms and rewrite it as 1 over rho times the parcel with respect to rho of the quantity rho times a sub rho. That will be the same thing as writing these two terms plus 1 over rho times the parcel of a sub phi with respect to rho plus the parcel of a sub z with respect to z. And let's see here, yep, I got all that, that right. correct. So that I got this term. All right, and so then I can say that the divergence of the vector in cylindrical coordinates cannot be written as follows. And this is where that came from. Now the reason why I went through all that work to show you how to do that is because most textbooks will show you this, We'll show you this, but we'll not show you how they actually got there. And it takes quite a while to figure out how exactly they end up from here to there. So in case you're interested, here's how it's done. And this is the final result of the divergence of a vector in cylindrical coordinates.